Flax is just one crop, but it can provide us with food, feed, and fuel. Because of its versatility, John Dwyer says it may be the answer to the global food versus fuel debate. And joining us now for more on that is John Dwyer. He's the CEO of Flax Energy, and it's nice to have you here at TVO. Great to be here. Okay, we're going to start from first principles here, sure. okay? Flax is what? Uh, flax is a what we call a cash crop, an agricultural oil seed. Uh, you can think about flax in the same family as canola or hemp seed. Uh, or peanuts, peanut oil, peanut all, all of these items that have a high oil yield. And it's grown where? In Canada. Canada does 56% of the world's flax. We're the largest growers in the world. I'm sure not a lot of people know that. What provinces? Mostly in the prairies. Uh, my company and, uh, and, the, and the group of rabble rousers I do business with are trying to get more and more farmers here in Ontario to grow flax. Uh, it's a fantastic crop and uh, we think uh, it uh, serves a far greater utility not only to the land but the people and the animals that eat it. Is it mostly a food or a fuel? It's both. It's both. That's the important component. We'll get to that then. What does your company do with it? We take Canadian grown non-growth modified flax seeds grown here in Canada um, and we organically crush them. Our plant is right here in downtown Toronto. We're the only biodiesel plant in the downtown core of a major city centre anywhere in the world and we crush the flaxseed, take out that oil, and we turn it into biodiesel, which goes in any diesel engine, in any truck, Volkswagen Jetta, car, train. Uh, Mr. Deleuze at Porter is doing a heck of a job with biofuels in his planes, which is to be commended. Uh, and we uh, crush it. Uh, the organic composition of a flaxseed is 40% oil, 60% meal. The oil goes to biodiesel. The meal we turn into animal feed, the largest producers of flax animal feed. So if you see omega-3 eggs, milk, beef, or chicken, it's because the animal was fed flax. So when you're finished with the flax, how much is actual waste you can't do anything Zero. with? Zero. Whole thing. We call it uh, cradle to grave. We use the entire process. Just curious. Downtown Toronto land is fairly pricey. What are you doing with a factory in downtown Toronto? It's not pricey at all. Maybe not where you are. You're out. In the, you're not really downtown. <laughs> no, yes, sir, I am. Well, bottom, I'm at the bottom of Cherry Street. Exactly. That's not downtown. I, I can throw a stone at the CN Tower if I had Ricky Romero's arm. <laughs> not this last season. Not this last not season. Not this last season, season you before. Could. You've been in business how many years? <laughs> Four years. How many people you got working for you? Uh, in our Toronto plant, about 12. We're lean and mean. We like it that way. Okay. How much carbon footprint is left behind by doing what you do to the flax? Zero. Nothing. Well, it's got to be something. You've got to be trucking it or doing something. Well, here's the way that we look at it. In terms of, we use existing infrastructure to either procure or move our flax. But here's the important concept about what we do. When you're moving seed, whether it be flax seed or animal feed or the biodiesel itself, it's going to be moved around in a diesel engine. It's moved in, our, in trucks that run on our fuel. So you have a 98% reduction in greenhouse gas emissions. You have no what we call unburned hydrocarbons, which is soot, which is the big problem we've had, say, with GO Train, why we're trying to, by 2018, move to electric trains. So the idea is fundamentally here, if you have the combines on the field running on biodiesel, if you have the trucks that take the seed to the cleaner and from the cleaner to our plant running on biodiesel, you're, you're dramatically eliminating the, uh, uh, reducing rather the, the carbon footprint. You are involved. essentially pollution free is what you're telling us. We like to think of ourselves that way, but there's some pretty smart people out there that might say otherwise, but we're about as close as you're going to get. There are a lot of renewable energy sources that we're looking at right now in Ontario, obviously, from mm -hmm. the sun to the wind to whatever else. What separates flax from all of them? We don't want government money. <laughs> that's the biggest difference. Well, I mean, uh, that's one of them. <clears throat> I think uh, there's three components that we see as this recurring theme in renewables. One, it's subsidized by the government. Two, it costs more than non-renewable products. And number three, it changes the way in which consumers consume. We're asking people to change their habits. If we really want something to be sustainable, it has to mimic the item it's replacing. And our business is fundamentally predicated on the economics of oil. You take one liter of oil, you make gasoline and diesel, you also make plastics, rubber synthetics, adhesives, epoxies, oil cosmetics. Oil is very versatile, isn't it? It's, it's probably the best economic model in the history of the modern competition market. But not great for pollution. Exactly. So what do you do? Find a product that replaces the negative connotations of oil, but mimics the economic components Meaning of it. Meaning it can do all these different things, not one just in, one thing. Exactly. W one input, multiple outputs. And you think flax is that? We think flax is but one small input in what we are coining now the new industrial revolution. We're trying to encourage folks of all uh, 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 ranges, whether it be a young entrepreneur or somebody who's retiring from the bank or in any range, 
to look at not just gasoline and diesel in replacing oil, but the plastics and the rubbers and the synthetics. Do you think that flax can actually replace oil doing no. all those different things? It can't. No, no, it cannot. It's not. How much of a dent can it make? Uh, well, I think that's a question that, that relies on the fact that oil is finite, but we still don't know how much of it is left. I mean, Canada burned 32.6 billion litres of diesel last year. Uh, we have a federal mandate Peter Kent implemented two years ago, which calls for 2%. That's 652 million litres. We could do a heck of a lot, a, a lot more of it. Um, but there's a lot of dynamics that come into place. Access to capital, where the venture cap, where the where the VC market is going. Uh, you know, we've only got five banks in this country that don't tend to invest in small, high-risk companies, especially in new industries like renewables. Let me bring up a graphic here of the production of energy in this country. You can see it on the monitor over my shoulder up there. These numbers according to Natural Resources Canada. And at the top of the list, number one, production of energy unit, crude oil, more than 40%. Number two, natural gas at just over a third. Number three, it's still coal, just under 10 percent. Four, hydroelectricity at seven and a half percent. Biomass clocks in at three and a half percent. Nuclear down there, just south of two percent. And the ones that get all the attention these days, wind, tidal, solar, the renewables, less than one percent. Any reason to expect that that last category is going to get any bigger in the immediate future? Not until government stops subsidizing it. I'm a huge believer that um, if you start to subsidize a company, uh, Keynesian methods are very important. It helps an economy get out of a slump. You help certain portions of, of, the, of the economy, you know, the idea of economics, it's Greek for house management. So you've got to manage the house in such a way that it finds its equilibrium again. They, those are important concepts. But when you subsidize an industry, like Ontario has done with wind and solar, it's only providing a long-term hindrance to its ability to actually work in the modern competition market. You don't think they need to subsidize just to get it started off the ground and then obviously you wean from the subsidy as you go? I didn't get a subsidy to get off the ground and wean and get started. I mean, I, I, really, I really think if you have, and not to put myself in this category too directly, smart business practitioners who can go out and slog through the period of time to actually raise that initial seed capital and get the right people to believe in you, then, then that's where it is. A lot of ethanol producers in Iowa got a lot of government subsidies too, and that's the United States of America. Yes, sir. The land of the free and the home of the brave. And it's a huge mistake. Huge mistake. Because? One third of all the corn in the United States this year, and it's important to note, corn crops and all crops by virtue of the drought in eastern uh, United States are going to be down nearly 35 to 40 percent. Hmm. Now that's just an estimate. It could be worse, it could be better. But one third of all the corn in the U.S. is going to go towards ethanol. And a lot of the folks in the ethanol business, and I, I hope this isn't an aside, but ethanol is use, uses number two non-sweet corn, which is not the corn that you and I would have. It's an animal feed. But it still matters on what it does to the commoditized indices of food. It drives up the commoditized price of corn in lesser developed countries and domestically for folks who... Um, uh, don't have the kind of access to higher quality foods. If you look at the kind of diets that people in lower income brackets have, corn plays more of a staple role in the food that they eat. And why does your business and your business model manage to avoid that conundrum? Can't cook with flaxseed oil. It was originally made to uh, used to make linoleum <coughs> flooring. The Latin term for flaxseed is linseed, hence the name linoleum. Most paint was actually made with linseed oil. Animal feed for flax has always been a growing industry, but there's been a serious scarcity of product. By virtue of the fact that we can turn what is deemed has a strong precedent of being a non-food uh, grade product, has a strong uh, industrial precedent into biodiesel, we now have so much of the meal left over for animal feed. And perhaps the most important part, we're turning your regular base flour whole all-purpose whole wheat flour for the first time in history we're increasing the nutritional value and the most important part is all three products the price stays the same we don't change the way the consumer uh, has to consume and we make it available to people who otherwise couldn't afford it but going back to that production of energy chart for a second if flax takes off the way you hope and expect it will what happens to the numbers on that chart i think that will be uh we, we will be, I don't want to say a negligible result. I think that we are, again, one component that proves that it's possible. We know that we're not capable of, of a game changer. And this is really important. I think a lot of entrepreneurs, and more importantly the government, only look at technologies if it's a game changer. That was a huge component of a lot of Ontario uh, provincial funds, like the Emerging Technology Fund, Next Generation Biofuse, all of these things. They only will support items that completely change the rubric of how we do business. 
I personally think that the best way to do it is to look to the, what our predecessors did properly and innovate on what they've done and go forward and find a product that makes money. Because if it doesn't make money, what's the sense? Nobody's going to buy it if it costs too much cash. Unless it saves the planet, which is what they're telling us the, the, the chief argument is. Yeah, I understand that concept. But here's the thing. If it's an environmental conversation or not, that becomes completely irrelevant. Because the basic fundamentals are, if the cost of a good is too high, not everybody can participate. Mm -hmm. And if we're saving the environment, we need everybody to participate. So there has to be a natural relationship between the price of a good and its, econ and its environmental benefit. Okay, let me follow up on that then. Uh, I looked at a 2008 report by a World Bank economist that said about 75% of the food price increases mm -hmm. from the years 2002 to 2008 could be attributed to biofuels. Mm -hmm. You claim to have solved this food versus fuel argument. Yes, sir. How so? Uh, because we're using what we consider a non-food grade product being flax oil. Again, what, the, the idea of sustainability is not about an end game. If we're working under the auspices of some sort of game theory where we're starting at a point and then we're ending at a specific point, it's going to take a lot of items that are going to coalesce to get us through this long journey to either eliminate oil or eliminate coal, which we're trying to do with uh, a wind and solar. But what we've done with the flaxseed is provide food, fuel, and animal feed. We also are in the paints market. We're in the flooring market. We do biomass. We, create, we take flax stock. We have a 20% higher energy rating than pure coal does with flax straw. That's how high it burns. So we've got six ranges of products because we don't exist in one, one, one market. So you're making this sound like it's kind of the magic bullet here. I, is it? We'd like to think that to a certain degree, we've created a model that mimics the way oil does business, and no product in the world ever did business the way oil does. And I defy anybody to tell me I'm wrong. So how come this hasn't caught on more? I'd like to think we're catching on pretty quick. <laughs> uh, I mean, you know, we're small and mighty. Uh, I suppose a portion of it is that we're in Canada. Canada is an increasingly difficult market uh, to raise capital in. But, you know, an interesting component of it, I was at the National Club last night and I heard Michael Lee Chan uh, speak uh, with the, uh, the uh, Jamaican Prime Minister who was supposed to be there, but there was a hurricane and unfortunately she had to go back uh, to the country. But he talked about the dynamics of perception versus reality. This man's made over $3 billion on perception versus reality. We have a perception of what is important and what becomes feasible in the renewable market. Mm. And the reality of it is, none of these things work unless they make money. So if you can bring these two natural things together, then the perception of renewables working outside of the realm of oil uh, becomes a silly concept. We have to work within what made oil so powerful and so compelling. And then I think renewables will begin to replace oil. Let me put one more thing to you, and this is a criticism that you've no doubt heard before. This is from Oxfam International, called Another Inconvenient Truth. They say biofuels currently provide a solution neither to the oil nor to the climate crisis and are now contributing to a third, the food crisis. The West's biofuels boom is contributing to deeper global poverty and accelerated climate change, while allowing governments to avoid difficult but urgent decisions about how to reduce spiraling demand for energy in transport. What's your reaction to that? I don't think they're completely wrong. I, I've read the same quote previously. Um, I think there's a lot of validity to the idea that agriculture doesn't hold all the answers. But there's also an important note to make. Are we trying to have a discussion about the future in terms of what we're capable of doing? Are we trying to replace oil because we know it's finite? Or are we trying to continually create roadblocks for folks who are entrepreneurs? The idea of having a zero carbon output is an impossibility. Uh, one of the largest car carbon contributors is cows in Brazil. I mean, no. So find me a market of, of folks who are, who are vegetarians and they'll look to that as a solution. But and the fact of the matter is, if we're actually going to move forward here and work towards replacing oil, we're going to have to realize that at some point um, there are going to be products that fail on that route. But agriculture still provides small portions of a solution. And I think that flax has that solution. In our last 30 seconds, John, is there a role for government in this, in your view? I think there's always a role for government. I think there's a role for smart business practitioners working with government. But if government continues to subsidize business in the way that Ontario did with the feed-in tariff program, they're really not helping anybody, well, in my so opinion. Is there a difference between subsidy and encouraging? I think so. 
Yeah. And you're for, you're for encouraging. I'm for encouraging. Personally, uh, I think once a, once a business has shown that it's a, uh, capable of making money and can go out and get private sector capital, that's the time that the government can come in. But before then, why waste taxpayers' money? That's John Dwyer, CEO of Flax Energy. Good of you to come into TVO tonight, John. Thanks. Absolutely. My pleasure. Support Ontario's public television. Donate at TVO.org.